Again, it's a great privilege for me to be with you here tonight. I'm sorry that I've been somewhat of withdrawn from the meetings, but I've been trying to fight off the flu, I think, since last night. And so I've been kind of just hanging out by myself. And so I'm trying to get through this so maybe I can be a little more sociable tomorrow. We have been studying the gospel of Jesus Christ. At least we have studied the introduction of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are going to continue to see some introductory truths before we go on to study exactly what is the gospel. Now, I have been told by the translator that I need to slow down in my speech. So I will also be trying to speak uh, somewhat slower tonight. Uh, turn with me to 1 Timothy, chapter 3. 1 Timothy, chapter 3. In verse 14, I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God which is the church of the living God and the pillar and support of the truth. By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. But the spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will fall away from the faith paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude, for it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. Now, in this passage, there are many, many important truths. I know that some of the things that the Apostle Paul says here are somewhat unusual and do not seem to apply to us today, but I can assure you they apply to us today as much as at any time in the world. So let's look beginning in verse 14. I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. Now, what is the first truth that we see here? That Paul writes Timothy so that Timothy will know how to conduct himself in church so that he will know how to organize the church, so that he will know how to set up the church's ministries, so that he will know how a minister ought himself to behave in the church. Now, this is a very important truth, and it makes the difference in everything. Down through the ages, there have been people who believed we should only do in the church what the Bible tells us to do. Others say that we should, we can do in the church anything that the Bible doesn't prohibit. I think you ought to be able to see that the second idea can be very dangerous. And it is the reason for all the trouble that we have today. Look at the way church and ministries are designed. Many times today, People go out into the culture, they go out into the city, and they do things like questionnaires. They go around and ask the people, what kind of church would you like? Or what would our church have to be in order for you to attend it? And they're trying to create a church for the people. Now that is humanistic, and it is extremely dangerous. Not only is it dangerous in that it's leading people astray, but it is also dangerous for the one who does it. And I'm going to show you why. He says here 
In verse 15, but in case I am delayed, I write to you so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. How do we know what we should do in the church? Only through the scriptures. And then he goes on, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. Now, first of all, it's the church of the living God. Whenever you hear the, the adjective living associated with God, usually it's also associated by the adjective true. And usually it has to do with false gods. If you look in the Old Testament, it'll say the gods that are nothing but idols, they cannot stand, they cannot walk, they do not hear, they do not speak. But God is the living and true God. It is declaration of his Godness, a declaration of his sovereignty, of his power as his unique place above all things. And here Paul uses that language to tell us all something. It is not your church. It's not my church. It is not the church of the secular Man, it is the church that belongs to God and he is sovereign over it. And he has told us in the scriptures how he wants us to conduct ourselves in the church. And for you to come up with some new ideas about how to do church. Is to run contrary to this text that we have in front of us. If you are a student of the Old Testament, and hopefully you are, what do we see in the Old Testament? Every time someone wanted to do something their own way, it led to disaster. The two sons of Aaron, what do they do? After these men had sat with Moses and their father and ate in the very presence of God, when he was up on the mountain, they then go in Leviticus chapter 10 and they offer fire. They offer worship that God had not ordained. And what happened to them? Fire came out and consumed both of them. They were killed. Now think about David, a man after God's own heart, but he was careless once when he wanted to bring the ark into Jerusalem. And instead of carrying it on poles with the Levites handling it, they carried it in a cart. Well-meaning. They were worshiping. They were loving God. They were excited about God's presence among the people. And then when the cart seemed like it was going to turn over, Uzzah, what does he do? He goes with good intention to do what? To straighten up the ark. We would think that God would appreciate this. God killed him. Constantly we are hearing people say, you know, well, you know, if your heart is right, it makes it OK. No, it does not. Because the only standard by which you can know if your heart is right is if you're doing what God commanded. You see. We have all these men today who are designing and redesigning church. Who are repackaging church and repackaging the gospel and doing things a different way. And they're not submitting themselves to scripture. Now, on the other side, it is true. There's a lot of other people who are just doing traditions that also do not have a biblical foundation. But either way. Well, it's like walking down a road with a cliff on both sides. Sometimes I will. Um, I'll talk especially to worship ministers. And and I'll say. In your study from Genesis to Revelation on how God wants to do worship, what have you learned? I've yet to have a man come up to me and say that he's actually done that. 
Most people start worship ministries today based upon what's most popular out there in the worship arena. Most people do worship today in the church based upon what has become popular in the greater evangelical community. But do you not see how dangerous that is? Remember the book of Judges. What is the great motto there? Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Every true reformation, every true revival has resulted in this. Not people inventing something new, but people going back to the scriptures. If you're a pastor, my question to you would be, what you do in church, is it based upon the dictates of Scripture or is it something handed down to you? Or is it something new that you've invented or that you've learned from some church growth specialist or someone on the cutting edge, edge of what's going on in society today? Why do you do what you do? You see, that's a very good question, isn't it? Just in order, because I'm not going to have like weeks and weeks with you, let me just amplify this for a moment. Let's say that I came to your church. And I was the new pastor of your church. It's my first Sunday. And so the first question I ask is this. How many men are intentionally discipling their wives and washing them in the water of the word, please raise your hand. And no one raises their hand, but they kind of look at each other and smile. And, and then I go, well, OK, how many of you men are intentionally discipling at least four times a week your own children in the scriptures. And again, the men would go. But then if I said this. As the new pastor, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cancel all women's groups. I'm going to cancel children's church and I'm going to cancel all youth groups. What would you do? You would stand up furious you would probably have me removed from being pastor and then you would spread throughout all the city that I'm a man who hates who hates women, children and young people. And you know what I would have to say to you? It would be this. Hypocrites, for the sake of your own traditions, you annul the commandments of God. When I asked you what men are discipling their wives, that was a direct command from Ephesians chapter five, and you're in direct disobedience to that command and it doesn't bother any of you. And then when I asked you which men here are discipling their children with intentionality and none of you raised your hand, that was a direct violation of Deuteronomy six in the Old Testament and Ephesians six in the New Testament. And you all laughed about it. But when I said I was going to touch your traditions, which God has never commanded, you're ready to crucify me. Do you see how dangerous it is to do church for years and years and years and never look at the scriptures? Do you see how far off you can get? As a matter of fact, we even build programs in the church in order to help people continue in their disobedience. Do you see how dangerous that is? You see, it doesn't matter at all if you say that you believe the scriptures are inerrant. It doesn't. It doesn't matter to me if you stand up and you say, I believe all the Bible is the word of God. That's meaningless. Unless you also believe another doctrine that goes with it. The doctrine of the sufficiency of scripture. That the scriptures are not only inerrant, but they are sufficient to dictate to you everything about faith and practice and every other area where they touch, they are true. 
And so church is to be built upon the scriptures. Just before I go on, just let me give you another idea. Automatically, you think. You know, it's very popular today. We're going to have children's churches and youth groups and we're going to put the youth over there to do their thing and the adults are going to do their thing. And you do not realize that actually you're ripping the church apart when you do that. You're doing the very opposite of what God intended. The purpose of the church is to have a group of people that almost have nothing in common, but they're brought together under the name of Jesus Christ and share everything in common and they love one another. So that you have the old and the young, the Jew and the Gentile, the Scythian and the Greek are all together there and no one can explain it. Also, taking the youth out and putting them by themselves and the children by themselves and the older people by themselves, where did you learn that? I'll tell you where you learned it. Somewhere around the 1950s and the generation gap. And that's the way you're supposed to train people. And that's how young people develop. And all these other lies that have nothing to do with Scripture. As a matter of fact, the Scriptures command you to do just the opposite. The Scriptures teach that young people should not be with young people all the time, but the young people should be with older people so they stop acting foolish and they grow up. But we don't do that, and that's why in the church we have 30-year-old young men playing video games. You see? He has told us what he wants in the church, but we do what's right in our own eyes. I want to tell you something. Sometimes it's not the Apostle Paul we hear walking through our churches. It's Aristotle and even worse, Freud, Skinner and Rogers and the modern psychologies that flow from their heresies. Be careful when you say you're biblical. Be careful when you say you believe the Bible. Be careful, very careful. Well, let's go on. He says, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. What is church to be about? Entertainment? No. It's to be about truth. It's where truth about reality is dispensed. It's where people are to come to understand what is real. Beginning with the person of God. The Christian religion is didactic. It is a truth religion. It is about teaching truth so that people can live in the reality of that truth and be free from their error and their sin. So we see so many churches today, they're not, they even admit they're not built around truth. They're built around entertainment. Or they're built around meeting felt needs. But that's not Christianity. Christianity is teaching them to obey everything that he has commanded us. Christianity is putting forth the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, as the only Savior and Lord of the world. And it's explaining to people how to live the one thing, well, many things, but one of the main things that I so appreciate about the Puritans. Now, when I mention the Puritans, that probably scares you. Why? Because everything you hear about the Puritans from the world is that they were evil. Well, here's something that I learned a long time ago. If the world calls something white, I can pretty much call it black. If the world calls something black, I can pretty much call it white. As a matter of fact, if I listen to everything the world says and I do the opposite, I'm pretty much in the realm of reality. The Puritans, their great desire was to do this, to conform every aspect of their life to the word of God. 
They wanted to know. Many people do not understand this, but the Catholic Church hated Luther, not simply because of his uh, doctrine of justification. Do you realize they hated Luther because of his doctrine of marriage? That marriage was not just to hinder lust and it was not just to produce babies. That marriage, according to the scriptures, has the purpose of showing, demonstrating Christ's love for the church as a man loves his wife and lays down his life for her, for her sanctification and progress in the faith. You see, the great difference between what we know is the Reformation and what we know of Catholicism and what we know of what's happening today. It goes something like this. The Catholic Church would go into an area and it would study that area. It would see its festivals and its holidays and its beliefs, and it would somehow try to incorporate those things into Christianity in order to make it popular, acceptable. The early Greek fathers did the same thing in that they tried to make a marriage between Christianity and Greek philosophy, and they came out with some tragic, horrible stuff. Well, guess what? The modern church movements among evangelicalism today are doing the same thing. They're going out into culture. They're seeing what culture's like, and they're trying to adapt the, the church to the culture in order to win the culture. The Great Reformation and any other revival or move of God did just the opposite. It turned away from looking at the culture and it looked back at God. And it said, what has God commanded us? That is what we'll do. And you say, if you do something like that, you'll never have an impact on the people. Well, look at the impact the Catholic Church has had. And then look at the impact that the modern church growth and prosperity and easy believism and seeker sensitive movement, look at the impact they've had not only on the world, but on the church contaminating it and making it look just as worldly as the people outside. And then look what the Reformation did. Not only did it change the morality of Europe, as a secondary, as an incidental, as something even further, it caused all the progress you're experiencing today. Conrad Mbewe from Zambia, one of my favorite preachers in the world, he says this, the modern preacher goes out into the people and asks them what they think they need. The man of God goes to God to receive the message that God says the people need. You see, when, when you do everything that is right in your own eyes, you mess up everything. When you do your family according to modern social theory, when you do your family according to psychology, you are in trouble. But that's what most people do. And even most Christian counseling today is not biblical. But it's a, some sort of a strange, perverted marriage between the secular thought and Christian. And whenever some thought is raised up on the same level as the Scriptures, here's what happens. That thought takes precedent over the Scriptures and the Scriptures become nothing. And that's what's happened. And so here we have this this truth in verse 15 that is so important. So you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. Which is the pillar of the truth, and that truth comes from the infallible, inerrant scriptures, and you must understand that. You see, I could come here, I could teach you on marriage. I could teach you on courtship. I could teach you on church. But if you are not convinced that everything you do must come forth from the scriptures, none of it will do any good. You must be convinced. You must be convinced. 
And let me say this. It's going to be very, very hard, but I'm going to say it. These men who today are repackaging the church to make it appealing to carnal men. When they stand before God one day, he will tear them to pieces. Imagine that I was going on a long journey. And I needed to leave my wife or my daughter with you to care for over the next five or ten years. And I present her to you in a beautiful, simple white dress. Her beauty is her simplicity, her innocence and her purity. But when I come back after that long journey, I find that you have dressed my wife like a prostitute. You have dressed my daughter like a prostitute and paraded her in front of carnal, wicked men in order to draw them to yourself. When I come back. I will hunt you down. And I will tear you to pieces. When Christ comes back and sees that men have prostituted his church, has painted his church and dressed her like a carnal, sensual woman. Promising people their best life now and prosperity and all these things and immoralities without number abounding in the midst of all of it. Christ will pull forth his whip and it won't be made of leather but pure wrath. This is his church. And those of us who know better and who are silent. This is what I've learned a long time ago. All men are cowards. All men are cowards. Unless filled with the Holy Spirit, all men are cowards. And if we know this is happening but we will not stand up in love to do something about it, then we too are guilty in our cowardice. A man told me one time after I preached, he says, if I do these things, they'll kill me. I said, then go and die. That's our job. Because if my wife was going out to grocery shop one night and as she was returning to the car, three men grabbed her and were beating her and seeking to hurt her and you walked by and you saw it and you did nothing because of your fear. After I find those men. I'll come looking for you. Do you see? It is a time not for shallow chested men. It is a time for us to stand up and say things are wrong when they're wrong. It is a time not not bitter spirit, not mean, not wanting to fight in love and in humility, but nonetheless standing our ground and saying, no, I'm not going to participate in this. My family's not going to participate in this. We're not doing it. We're going to follow as for me and my house, we're going to follow the Lord and will not have any part with this evangelical circus that's flooding the world and most of it coming out of my country but much of it already having taken root in yours. And once it does, it'll spread from you and even pollute more nations. We must make a stand. Because it's God's church. Now he goes on in verse 16 and he says, by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. By common confession, it is commonly acknowledged among the people of God. There is no debate here. No dispute at all. This is the common truth among the people of God that great is the mystery of godliness. Now, what does that mean? Great is the mystery that leads to true devotion to God, to true piety, to true godliness, to true holiness. Now, what is that mystery? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because now he's going to go on and say he who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. What is the great mystery that not only brings redemption, 
but makes a people holy. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, is it not true? I think I said this last night, but I'll say it again. Is it not true that if someone came to Norway or the United States and they said, we are going to have a conference on healing and prosperity and all sorts of things of that gender. Would it not be true that it, they would fill up the largest auditoriums in this country? They've done it. But then if, a, if someone came and said, we are going to have a conference, a week long conference setting forth. The gospel of Jesus Christ and what it meant for him to die there on that cross. The place would be filled with empty seats. You see, these false prophets, their God is their belly. But here's something that you need to understand. Also, the people who follow them, their God is also their belly. They don't want Jesus. I can tell you, I can tell what interests you biblically by what most comes out of your mouth in your conversation, by what most you long for that you run to. Paul is setting here before us the greatest thing that has ever happened in human history. God becomes a man. He is revealed in the flesh. He is vindicated in the spirit. What does that mean? That at his death, he was then buried, but he was vindicated in that death by the spirit who raised him from the dead and proved publicly declared that that sacrifice was sufficient for the atonement of our sins, that God accepted that sacrifice. That whoever believes will be saved. And then he says it was seen by angels. And I, sometimes I think this argument is brought in to bring to witness both heaven and earth. But not only that. To rebuke the dumbness of men. And the dumbness even of those who call themselves believers. That so many people would marvel all over so many worthless trinkets. But when Jesus Christ is proclaimed, they do not marvel. It's one of the reasons why I believe Jesus said the queen of the south will rise up on the day of judgment and she will condemn this generation because one greater than Solomon was here. I believe that most of these preachers today on television and things like that, they would rather see Solomon. And all his wealth than see Jesus Christ and all his righteousness. You see. How do you know that you've become a Christian and how do you know that you are growing to maturity? Because all the minor things start falling away from your view and Christ, Christ, Christ becomes more of all that you desire. He is your desire. Heaven is not even your desire. Christ is your desire in heaven. And if you long to be in heaven, it's only because Christ is there. As a matter of fact, I could I could go to an extreme and say that the Christian would rather be with Christ in hell than in heaven without him. It's a longing for Christ. It's being mesmerized by Christ. It's seeing the true beauty that is found in Christ. But here's something very important for those of us who are ministers. Do you realize this is our task? Our task is to spend long hours alone with God in his word so that when we get up before people, we can pull forth these beautiful gems of who Christ is out of the word and show them to the people so that the people also become mesmerized with this same Jesus. We are something like the servant of Abraham who went looking for a wife. For his son, Isaac. I think that that possibly, you know, he goes there and he arrives and he sees her. And what does he do? He gives her he gives her jewelry. He gives her beautiful things from her husband. 
from her future husband. And I've got a feeling that when they were coming on the way back, maybe every time that the servant turned around and saw maybe a little bit of doubt in her face, he pulled out one more jewel and said, this is this is from him. Now, he just had jewels. He just had gold as pastors and preachers. Every time we see a doubt in a believer's face, we pull out just one more beautiful truth about Christ and we lay it at their feet and say, this is for you. This is for you. That's the job of the preacher. That's why if if, if you're not a pastor and you're not a preacher. And, and you do have a pastor or a preacher who is given to the study of God's word, you protect him. You protect him. If you hear anybody say that's all our pastor does is sit in there and study, you defend him. If his desire is to bring the word of God out to the people, then you defend him in that you let him study, you let him have time for prayer, you guard his life. Was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations. What was proclaimed? I mean, something was proclaimed among the nations. Was it uh, how to has, have your best life now? Was it uh, how to prosper? Was it how to do miracles? What was proclaimed? The mystery. What is the mystery? The gospel. With what result that leads to godliness? Preaching the gospel so that what happens to people? They are transformed and they are godly. They are Christ like they are righteous. They are a holy people, not a bunch of immoral liars. But holy, godly, loving people. That's the message that is to be proclaimed. Believed on in the world, taken up in glory. The same glory that he had with the father before the foundation of the world. But just a little different. You say, well, how just a little different? Because that glory he shared with his father before the foundation of the world, he shared that glory as deity. Now he shares that glory as deity, the fullness of deity. But also as a man. The one seated at the right hand of God is God, the son. But he's also man, our brother. And thus he is not ashamed, as the writer of Hebrews tells us, he is not ashamed to call us brother. Can you imagine that the, the ruler of the universe of all that is and the fullness of deity is also of our same stock, of our same flesh? It's amazing. It's amazing. Now, he says in verse one of chapter four, but the spirit explicitly says that in the latter time, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, first of all, he says, but the spirit explicitly says we don't find this kind of structure anywhere in the New Testament. I mean, listen to Paul's words. I mean, this should show you what Paul is getting ready to say is very unique. It's extremely important. We don't get this anywhere else. He says the spirit doesn't just say that would be an unusual uh, structure in itself. But he says the spirit explicitly. Explicitly, clearly, emphatically says, what does he say that in latter times? Now, what does that mean? I know that I've heard so many people say, well, you know, Brother Paul, we're in the latter days. And I say, how do you know that? Well, you know, the great charismatic movement or the signs and wonders that are coming back and we're in the latter days. I look at them and say, my dear friend, the latter days began about 2000 years ago. Well, what do you mean? Again, go back to the scriptures when Peter quotes Joel. In the last days, the mess, the whole messianic idea is found within these words that with the coming of the Messiah, the last days began. And that was 2000 years ago with his coming, his death, his resurrection, his ascension to the right hand of God. We have been in the last days for 2000 years. And that's why what Paul is telling Timothy 
is relevant for Timothy. Because Timothy was living in the last days. He said, in latter times, some will fall away from the faith. Now, falling away refers to a departure. Okay? A departure. It is being somewhere and falling to somewhere else. It is. Well, let me just say it this way. The mere statement indicates going from something old to something new. Going from something that Christianity already has to going to some new invention that someone has figured out. It's always something new. Do you see that? And what is going on in evangelicalism today? Every time someone does something crazy. I mean, they can get up and prophesy nonsense. They can fall on the floor and bark like a dog. They can shake until you think their head and their arms are going to come off. You can do all this stuff. And if you say to them, I don't see this anywhere in the Bible. What is their answer? You can't limit God. This is something new. Do you see? Always. 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 And that's why I say reformation and revival in church history has never occurred by going forward. It has always occurred by going backward. It is not finding something new. It is finding the old that was left behind. It is a rediscovery of immutable, unchangeable, infallible, biblical truth. This is so important, beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't be carried away by every wind of doctrine. There's another thing that shows how much all this new stuff is false. And that is the temporary nature of it. Have you ever seen that? Every two or three years, what happens? It's a new thing sweeping the land and it never lasts. But it, what does do one thing, it degenerates. It just keeps getting more ludicrous and more immoral as it keeps going. And then because people are so convinced of it, the leaders themselves can be immoral men. But then they come with the argument Touch not God's anointed. We know they're immoral. We know they got their problems, but God's spirit is upon them. That's absolutely the very opposite of the way the Apostle Paul defended his ministry. He never said, I'm an apostle, so therefore you have to listen to me. He said, you have known my behavior among you. And it proves I'm an apostle. Countless times he would say, you know, you've seen, you witnessed, please remember. You see? His character. Now, it says that some, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Listen, if the devil were to take a vacation with all his demons in the south of France, okay, men would still be subject to error, and heresy because of the depravity of their own heart. And I want to say that that's very important for you to understand. The big problem here is not the devil. The big problem is the flesh. And for the unconverted man, the big problem is his unconverted heart. But he tells us something very unusual here, that this apostasy is not just a natural apostasy as a result of the radical depravity of a man's heart. But there's the working of something external, deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. This is not just some personalized comment about general evil. There is a real devil, a real person called the devil. And there are a real host of fallen angels that are aligned with him. They are personal. They are real. They are individual. And they work corporately. But here's what I want you to see. 
Paul here in verse one, again, is saying something that he never says anywhere else. I mean, this is this is unusual. He's talking about some apostasy that is so demonic, so satanic, so evil that he uses this extraordinary language to show us. So we're expecting something big, aren't we? In in verses three and four, I mean. Look what Paul has said, paying attention to deceitful spirits, doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. We're expecting that Paul is now going to tell us something amazing, maybe the coming of the Antichrist, you know, I mean, this language is incredible. And when we hear it, we almost go like this. Well, let's get ready, because the next thing he's going to tell us is going to be terrifying. And then he comes to three. Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods. Paul, you set us up saying the spirit explicitly says that doctrines of demons and schemes of devils and hypocrisy and liars and this this united force of wicked men seared in their conscience who are coming they are impulsed, they are driven, they are taught, they are empowered by the devil himself. And now they're going to come into the church in the last days and they're going to teach us not to not to get married and don't eat certain things. That just it's like I've always read that and I'm like, what, what are you doing? Ah, you're going to see what he's doing. Right now, you're probably saying, well, in Norway, there just aren't a whole lot of preachers going around saying we shouldn't eat food. I mean, as a matter of fact, they're probably eating too much. <laughs> and there's hardly anyone going around going, hey, don't get married or or abstain from all earthly desires in the realm of sexual relationships. There's no one doing that. So we think to ourselves, well, how does this apply? Oh, it applies more than maybe any other time in church history. Because what Paul is saying is so powerful. In chapter three, remember, the Bible wasn't written in chapters. Sometimes if you take chapter four and you don't look at chapter three and you interpret four by itself, you mess up. What has he just got through saying? By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness above all things, the gospel has pre preeminence in the church. The gospel is the center of the church. The gospel is the center of our proclamation. It is all about Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, his ascension into heaven, his work of redemption. This is it. And he says this. If anybody. Replaces the gospel with anything. It is a doctrine of demons. For example, in my church, most people homeschool. But if homeschooling. Becomes the thing that we center around. And all our life and Christian life and church is about homeschooling and raising our children, it becomes a doctrine of demons. If you start a church and it's all about, you know, prosperity or it's all about gifts or it's all about this. Doctrines of demons, if it supplants and takes the place of the gospel of Jesus Christ, anything, any teaching that comes into the church that makes the gospel take any other place than first, it is a doctrine of demons. Legalism. Teaching Christianity is just a moral ethic is a doctrine of demons, even though Christianity has a distinct ethic. Christianity is not primarily about ethics. Christianity is about Christ and the gospel. If he's not front and center. It's a doctrine of demons. Just recently in the United States, Christians have become, it seems, very, very concerned about what they eat about organic foods and all kinds of stuff like that. And now you see these Christian conferences all over the states about organic foods and eating right and everything. And that's fine. 
But when that takes over your vocabulary, it's become a doctrine of demons. Do you see that? And isn't it true that down through history and even today, we're constantly seeing the gospel of Jesus Christ taking back seats to so many other things? It must be first place. What God has done in Christ, it must take first place. It must. If I'm teaching my children, like um, the way I disciple my children is. We work on one book in the New Testament, verse by verse, about four times, five times a week in which one of my children reads the verse. I do the commentary discussion question. Then the next one reads the next verse. And we do about seven verses in the New Testament through just various books. We've been through Romans, Ephesians, first, second, third, John, Colossians, Thessalonians, just we go through a lot of books, but we also go through each night. We try to do seven verses in the book of Proverbs so that I want by the time my children leave, they have gone through the book of Proverbs countless times. But even when we study the book of Proverbs, every one of those lessons makes it way makes its way back to Jesus. It's all about the gospel. It's all about Jesus. And that's what we learn from this passage here, brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, tomorrow, what we're going to do is we're going to get into the gospel. We're going to study the gospel. And start off from the very beginning, we're going to work our way through. If I have to even ask Bjorn to give me more teaching times, I don't care. But we're going to go through the gospel. And I'd like to make our way also to what is known as the doctrine of Christian assurance. Christian assurance. Assurance. And so, brothers, let, let me give you just a, a short kind of illustration. When. You know how people have this idea that the gospel of Jesus Christ is Christianity 101, you know, you do that and then you go on to other things. When I was graduating with my master's, I met with two of my professors, a preaching professor and a Greek professor. And um, they were talking to me about getting my Ph.D., which I didn't do. I went ahead and went to the jungles of Peru. And um, but they said, what would you want to study? And I said, well, if I could study anything, and do my work in any area, it would be the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, I didn't do that. I didn't go for my Ph.D. I went to the jungles. But there I began my study of the gospel. I went to Peru in 1988. And. Many years have passed. I have conscientiously, purposely, with intentionality. Studied the gospel all these years, it's been my primary area of study. I have written hundreds, if not a few thousand pages. On the gospel. Right now, I've just come to the point where I'm going to start talking. I'm going to start writing about the cross. It's taken that many years just to get there. And you say, well, why? Well, you know, you talk about the incarnation. About him becoming man, but you can't understand the incarnation unless you understand what what he was before the incarnation. His glory, his power, his relationship with his father. And then the incarnation, you must understand everything that, that comes about there in that incarnation and every word of it is glorious. Every word is glorious. And then you go from there, his incarnation to his perfect life. This most marvelous thing that no one has ever done, his perfect life. And then this one who is above all things worthy, infinitely above, goes to a tree. And your sins are imputed to him. And God, the father crushes him under the full force of his wrath, his own hatred. 
The Father pours out His just, holy indignation, wrath and hatred upon His Son that should have fell upon us for all our sin. And then the death of Christ and then the resurrection and power and glory and His ascension into heaven. The reunion that took place. The glory that was manifested. And now His seated rule. See, it's so important not just to say rule, but His seated rule. It means He shall not be moved. It means to rule over all the nations. It requires no effort from Him. You see, the Gospel is not a lifetime study. It's an eternal study. That's what, that's what eternal life is. Eternal life begins the moment you believe. And what is eternal life? That you might know God. And it begins now and it ends never. Because he is infinite and you will not be able to exhaust his glories. If you live an eternity of eternities in heaven, you will not even have reached the foothold, the, the foothills of Mount Everest. That is the glory of God. And so tomorrow, Lord willing, that's where we will we will start in looking at this. But make no mistake, dear church, so much pollution has come to you already. So much stuff from even farther west than you. Reject it. Reject it and hold on to Christ and strengthen what remains and preachers rise up. Rise up, rise up, rise up. Not in anger, not in hatred, not in bitterness. But stand your ground. Preach the word and you young ministers that are thinking about, you know, maybe planting churches or taking over churches. Just realize this in all your zeal and zeal is good and all your desire for truth. And that is important also. Remember this. Moses could have made it into the promised land in 11 days if he hadn't taken Israel with him. But that's not why he was going to the promised land. It was to take Israel with him. And you better be patient with your church. And you better be kind to those who don't understand. And you better woo them and win them with the truth. And with proper arguments from Scripture, but also with the character of your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word. And I pray, dear God, that you will use it in the hearts of your people to make them strong and conform to the image of Jesus Christ. It's in his name I pray. Amen.